Walker Palin, Head of Corporate Sustainability at ASDA. ASDA, as everyone knows, is a uh, part of Walmart, um, and Walmart have been one of the biggest companies to emba embrace supplier standards. They've put it on record that uh, they will not source from Chinese companies who do not provide certification of their compliance with Chinese environmental laws and regulations. They're the biggest company in the world by turnover. They've got 10,000 suppliers in China, um, and they have a real uh, ability to make a difference. Um, so it's with great pleasure that we now hand over to Julian. Thank you very much. Um, it's interesting, I guess, when you look at um, just, just the intro that I had just then, how much that one announcement that we made in 2008 in China has you know, laid uh, the, the pathway in, in terms of what we've done on sustainability in our supply chain since then. It's quite incredible how you make one announcement and it, you know, it really uh, binds the supplier community together. It's probably fair, though, if I just backtrack a little bit, because if I were to say we started on our supply chain, that would be entirely incorrect. You know, we started on uh, ourselves and our direct operation. And our journey on sustainability started in 2005. And one of the challenges that we had, and I guess challenge that lots of you will face, is how do you bind uh, a business that is as large as ours, operating in so many different parts of the world, in a common direction on sustainability? So, you know, what may be uh, difficult for us may be impossible for Brazil. You know, and vice versa. What are their priorities? Will be very different to our priorities. And actually, one of the things that really struck me when I first joined ASDA was Brazil was putting a lot of effort into helping street kids pick up um, litter and turning it into recyclers at the same time that we were lobbying the government over the CRC. And so how fascinating that you get these two different sides of what we now know as sustainability. So we said, we'll actually set... Uh, three aspirational goals that we know we can't achieve very easily. So we said we will be supplied 100% by renewable energy, we will create zero waste, and we will uh, sell products that sustain people and the environment. So from that, you could then set your own targets depending on which country you operated within, but the whole business was still moving in the same direction. But it's fair to say that we started on the first two, on energy and waste. Because I don't think it would be right for us to go out to a supplier and say, we want to work with you on X, Y, Z, because that supplier at that point could quite happily and quite rightly turn around to us and say, so what have you done in your own organisation? Who are you to come and tell us to do things? How do you know this is the right direction of travel? So we needed to understand the issues better. If you think back to 2005, most people in this room didn't have the understanding of carbon, for example, as we do today, let alone some of the other issues like water. So we set ourselves a framework within the three areas, and then we said, actually, our strategy needs to be holistic in terms of engaging our supply base, engaging our customers. And we serve over 200 million customers every week as Walmart, and over 18 million customers every week as Asda. So, you know, we touch a lot of people. We also need to take along our colleagues, you know, the, the, the people that work for us, and we also need to make sure we play a part in the communities in which we operate. So we called that Sustainability 360. So we've got our framework now in place of how we make sure all of our um, objectives are working in the same direction of the different areas under Sustainability 360 that we need to focus on. And I think it's fair to say, up until probably a year ago, we were making great progress on this focus on our operations. Um, we, we now divert almost all of our waste from landfill. We're about 5 or 6% off 100%, and that's because the infrastructure doesn't exist to divert some of the, the fractions that are left after you've recycled everything in certain parts of this country. Our new stores are nearly half less emissions than they were when we started, and our existing stores are nearly a quarter less emissions than where we started. And our logistics fleet is about 42 43% less carbon than when we started. So we've made great progress. But we looked at it probably in, I guess, start of 2009 and said, OK, we could continue um, on the path that we currently have, but are we putting our, um, our efforts in the right place, in the right direction? At the same time, uh, the US business had done a piece of work with Conservation International. I thought it was interesting hearing some of the slides we saw earlier around where, as an organization, are our main impacts. 
and our main impacts are in our supply chain. So much so that we reckon if we gold-plated all of our activity and our direct operations, we'd probably hit about 8% of what we could possibly achieve. So 92% of our emissions are in our supply chain. So we started at the beginning of, of 2010 to say we, we want a, a new strategy, and we call that strategy Sustainability 2.0. And Sustainability 2.0 is about drawing a line in the sand and saying, actually, there is still work to be done on our direct operation. We still want to get more energy efficiency, more renewables in our business. There's still some stuff we can do with our transport fleet and with our waste. But the vast majority of our targets now going forward will be in our supply chain. If I was to extrapolate ahead to 2015, when Sustainability 2.0 finishes, I would expect almost all of those targets to be supply chain, if not all of those targets to be supply chain. And that doesn't mean that the operations wouldn't continue, but I think they would go more in the line. They would be less transformational. They'd be more around buying new kit as and when it becomes available or doing the right thing as and when technology changes. But the real change being in our supply chain. But we have a number of barriers, I think, in terms of getting the engagement that we need from our suppliers. Um, first of all, how do we, uh, again, acting as a global organisation, get all of our uh, markets, all of the countries in which we operate, to then work together on a more granular level. So we're all working together on to, be, uh, to uh, sell products that sustain people in the environment, but actually some of this requires global coordination. So we launched at the end of last year something we call sustainable agriculture. And sustainable agriculture is about getting our arms around our supply base that supplies us with agricultural uh, commodities, so that could be fish in the sea, or it could be trees, or it could be farmers growing food for us. So we've defined agriculture very widely. So this is an area of particular focus for us that we need to, to understand better, that we need to create the partnerships. Some of this is about us as an organisation continuing to be able to, to sell the products that we want to. And some of it is around building capacity so that our company can continue to grow. If you look at uh, the um, MassMart uh, deal that we just signed in South Africa, where we now um, own majority share of MassMart, we wouldn't be able to have signed that deal without saying we are serious about making a difference for the small farmers that operate in South Africa, providing them with a route to market. So it's good for them because they can help bring themselves out of poverty, and it's good for us because we now have uh, the, the products that our customers want to buy from our stores. Another um, issue that we had is around how do you measure um, just something simple that we now understand, like, like carbon emissions. Fairly simple from our operations, because we can look at conversion factors that governments produce and calculate it from that. But actually, there are competing systems, as I'm sure you're aware, when you uh, put it down to the product level. So we created something called the Sustainability Consortium, of which we're only a partner. It's not our consortium. It's run by academic organizations in the US that is now trying to um, look at all the different scorecards, to use a term we're going to come to in a minute, and all the different metrics out there, and trying to agree a means by which we calculate the impact of these products. And actually, we've made it harder on ourselves as well. So we've included social aspects in there, as well as carbon and as well as natural resources. So that works ongoing. We set a target to frame all of this of a 20 million ton reduction of carbon in our supply chain by the end of 2015, just to focus minds on, on where we're going. And we've got a project within the UK that's looking at our factory base itself and what we can do with our factories to share some of the learning that, that we've, uh, we've managed to get through these projects we've created. So we've got a framework, and now we're trying to unpick some of the barriers that are in place to help us make the progress that we need to. Thank you.